So welcome to Society 2045's Friday Talks. My name is Jose Leal. I'm a co-founder of Society 2045. And what we do is these Friday Talks in order to bring together the voice of pioneers. What are they see in the future? And how can they help us collectively see a new future for us or for ourselves, excuse me. So today we have our special guest, Max Borders. And Max has been writing some books about what he thinks the future will look like. And we hope to learn a bit about his vision for the future for 2045 and how that vision might help us understand what all of us are doing in our own respective projects and our efforts to make a change in this world. Welcome, Max. Thank you so much. Although I will say, I thought this was the 2046 meeting, so I don't know if I'm going to have a lot to say about 2045. Um, actually, we don't know why 12, 2045 specifically. <laughs> the only thing we know is it had to be far enough away that we don't worry about what we're doing today, and yet not so far that we'll all still be there. Uh, so hopefully that will be true for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yes. Well, uh, welcome again. and. Um, I, I wanted to just get a sense for those of us who don't know you, um, what makes you worth listening to? Well, if you ask my family, not that much. Um, <laughs> but um, I, have, I have a mission, I guess, or a, a belief in the promise of decentralization. Uh, and decentralization can come across an, in a way that's cold and systems oriented, not so human. But I, I believe that the upshot of decentralization is a, a far more humane way of living together and navigating the world uh, in coordinating, collaborating and co-creating as a species. And that really, it's, it's, it's uh, more or less, I'm committed to the idea of peacefully breaking up centers of power, whether that be corporate power or government power, or usually both in unholy alliances. And I don't, and I don't, and, and that, that, that doesn't mean anything violent. In fact, the, one of the bases of, of my decentralist philosophy is is nonviolence, uh, what the what the yogis called ahimsa, which is uh, you know nonviolence and thought, word and deed, and being a practitioner of that is where we start when we begin to think about decentralization. Whether that's decentralized organizations that are more participatory and more remunerative for everyone involved, or at scale when we start to think about how to govern ourselves uh, peacefully and uh, interact in a cosmopolitan way with people from other cultures, climates and circumstances. So that's the general, that's my general, that's what drives me and will continue to drive me into the future, I think. And you've written now three books, is that correct? Yes. And yes, the third one is coming out, coming out in a couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm really excited. Yeah, so t tell us a little bit about that progression. Like you've written these three different books and from the outside, they seem somewhat different, but I, mm. I suspect that that's an evolution of your thought. For, for sure. Um, if some of it is an evolution of, of my thought that has come from feedback. You know, I mean, I, when you find that people are engaging your work, it's, it's, it's a, it really is a, a, a blessing. And, and I become all ears at that point. I want to, when, when someone is, a, is sort of walking around in your thoughts, it's important to listen to see how it lands with them. So my first book is called The Social Singularity. And the basic idea behind The Social Singularity, I won't bang on about it, just give you a rough overview, is that, um, that there, there is a process that is happening. Where there's a lot of, you know, a lot of energy, light and heat both, on the idea of the technological singularity. Ray Kurzweil's idea, which he cribbed from from others, but basically the idea is that you're moving to, as you move into the future, computer processing power increases a la Moore's law, and you, you'll get to a situation in which AI becomes so advanced that it becomes smarter than us, it becomes sentient, it wakes up, it becomes more agentic. There are fears and hopes about that future, 
And what I want to say is, okay, yes, and. I acknowledge that that process is unfolding. It may not full unfold at the rate that, that um, Kurzweil hopes, but there's another process that's happening. And, and, and I call it the social singularity. And that's really that technology enables, enables us to lateralize our relationships in interesting ways. When we begin to lateralize our relationships, we, get, we begin to be able to communicate, collaborate, and coordinate at scale across geographies. So just as we're doing right now, I mean, this is one of the mechanisms for that, certainly at a, at a very basic level. That's not to say that the company that owns Zoom is, centra is not centralized, but it, you know, that we're taking baby steps in the direction of, of coordination, collaboration at scale, and that this is really a process that is going to make a lot of changes in the direction of decentralization. The, uh, and that, that may sound odd, particularly in this age of great powers. Right now, a lot of our attention is on is on Russia or China, you know, um, I'm, I live in the United States. And so this, the machinations of great powers seems to be sucking the oxygen out of, the, out of our collective conversations. But I really do believe that it's the, in the little things that are happening uh, right now with, with these lateralization technologies that um, in, as up to and including the social technologies inside of organizations such as sociocracy, holacracy, teal organizations, that sort of stuff that I take it, you guys are pretty interested in that stuff. Um, but as well as the crypto space and the promise of DAOs and cryptocurrency tokens with new alternatives to, to ways you can um, manage common pool resources. So, um, and, and indeed your own uh, sovereign resources, if you know, have tokens in a wallet and that sort of thing. But all of these processes are unfolding for us so for that first book, I wanted to really look at that unfolding process and recognize its promise. But it was a very systems-oriented book. I mean, I you know a lot a lot of people like that book, and and um, and from the standpoint of selling it on Amazon, it's very it's it's just the right size, <laughs> okay? Because you know um, there's some economics involved in the size of a ideal size of a book on Amazon, and another day for that, but. That book is is really it's done well for me and and allowed me to meet a lot of interesting people who share sensibilities. But one of the feed, pieces of feedback I got about that book is that it it didn't go deep enough into the considerations of of I'm going to skip over the second book for a moment to this to this latest book, which is the subtitle of the Decentralist is the the most recent book is Mission Morality and meaning in the age of crypto. So that is really a response to what people were crying out for after having read the more systems-oriented book, The Social Singularity. And um, to some extent, uh, you know, the, the, the second book, After Collapse, is, um, is a way of talking about how we deal with the, the nature of concentrated wealth and power in society, and that that's that's becoming too top heavy and complexity, complexity science tells us that these sort of organizational forms are going to be more fragile than we think. And if, if and when they collapse, we need to be ready with the kinds of things that I'm talking about. But this third book really focuses on those humane aspects, mission, morality, and meaning. And I'll stop there. I always like to understand sort of the progression because we know that our thoughts don't just pop out of nowhere, right? They, they grow, they morph, they, they learn. And uh, it sounds like you've gone through a, a learning process there. And I, I think one of the interesting things that you point out is that um, the, the practical, the technical aspect is what we often put our minds to, uh, but it's really the human aspects that make those things viable. And so that's absolutely it. Yeah. That's, that's really where you're going. So, so tell us a little bit about uh, what you think that um, 2045 looks like with, with those two things that you've just mentioned. Uh, how do they uh, manifest? What does day-to-day -day life look like um, in, in 2045? Um, it, 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 from the perspective of today, 2045, at least in my mind, seems a bit paradoxical um, because 
one of the things about increasing complexity in our in our lives and in our societies is that we want to we tend to want to specialize there's only so much time in a day there's only so many interests you can take on and so on um so i think from the standpoint of of economics and economic reality you know what you might call uh, just traditional economics i don't think that the 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 reality of specialization is going to go away. The problem I think is that, and I'm getting to the 2045 bit, but I think the problem with 2022 is that, that as we have specialized more, we have tended to become withdrawn and less participatory in the structures and practices and communities that have, have conferred morality and meaning in the past. So our mission as it were, is to restore that sense of connectedness with each other, participation in our communities, participation even in our family lives. Um, you know, I can, I, I'm sure you, you all can be workaholics, as, as can I. And, you know, part of reorienting ourselves around sort of timeless truths, timeless moral truths, um, uh, certain ones in any case, is that we can become less unmoored or more connected to to some of these structures of society that um, that currently we're, we're outsourcing to distant powers and authorities, whether those are corporate or government. Uh, so for example, you know, instead of being good in the world or feeling responsible for our neighbors, we have the low cost propositioning of signaling our rectitude on social media. It doesn't matter what party you're in, it tends to be the case. It's like, I support this team, I support this tribe, I support this party in their, their um, and, 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 I, and I'm agnostic with respect to the kinds of values that your tribe or your party holds. What I'm proposing is that the, the less we outsource those to distant powers, I have this funny little metaphor about, the, the, about uh, waking up and finding one morning that on your smartphone, you have only two apps, the red app and the blue app, okay? And, and that's a system that runs on DOS, the democratic operating system, particularly in the United States. And while I know we have uh, folks from other countries who may have parliamentary systems and so on, generally speaking, there is still, if, if, I, if we were to go to, for example, Britain, you know, the Labour Party and the Conservatives are the two dominant parties, and that's you know, the, the Lib Dems are come in a distant third, but they're not that strong and they have to form coalitions. But whether you have a bicameral system like we have or a, um, a parliamentary system, there tends to be this, this kind of polarization uh, and, and rancor that's due, I believe, to the incentives of partisan politics. And what that does is it causes us to, to take our attention away from the immediate sphere, a sphere that we actually have more control over, and replaces it with a spectacle, an illusion of, of, of democratic elections that, that are basically crying your teardrop in the ocean and expecting the tide to turn. So what I'm trying to do with this third book is this like, don't forget about your, your, your politics is not your morality. Your moral, your, your fundamental morals are to be practiced. And it is in the practice of those basic moral spheres that we will find the good in the world. And at the same time, we have to architect systems that, that give us stronger incentives to be more participatory as moral agents in community. And that is for me, the important message so that we can begin to trans transcend political tribalism. And in 2045, have flourishing people who are members of communities who um, look out for their neighbors, look out for their loved ones, um, um, and, and, and that that manifests itself in all sorts of ways. Sometimes it might be, no, the community is not going to give this to you. Instead, you need to change, you, you, you may want to consider changing your habits, we, or maybe the community says, we can help find a job for you, or we can help find an opportunity for you. Um, that this very, you know, this politics tends to be very algorithmic and, and, and lobotomizes people, treats them as plot points. Communities, however, treat people as real human beings 
and we get to know each other and we and all of those human dynamics can be scary and they can be bad but on net the the incentive structures of community really are about bringing out the good in people and that's what i'm really interested in in 2045 that is what we're going to see more of that i believe that's my optimism and and you think that that seeing more of it um as you describe is it something that we slowly develop between now and then or do you think there's going to be a tipping point at which what you've described becomes the natural predisposition for people that that people think that that's the right thing and not what we're doing today is there a tipping point or is this a progression if i'm being honest i have to refer to the second book and i'm not trying to show my books right now okay <laughs> oh, that's okay we're going to strip really... out all the stuff about your books we're going to just cut it out anyway, oh so. good yeah 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 well, th that's great <laughs> um but but I but I have to acknowledge it because one of the premises of the second book after collapse is that there will be a collapse coming. That really we have we have bought into this idea of of hierarchical structures, hierarchical governance structures that allow us to outsource more and more of our responsibilities for ourselves and our community to to distant capitals or distant corporations, and and that that is unsustainable in along a number of dimensions. OK, um, living in the United States, you know, apart from Japan, we have the highest debt levels in the de developed world. Um, and, I, and I don't want to sound like some partisan hack is going shaking my fist about the national debt. Uh, but that is just one one dimension of concern that I have about the unsustainability of this system. Right. Which is that it's fueled by debt. It's being propped up. And we're starting to see now that that the dissolution, or at least the the cracks in that system, with the inflation that we're seeing now. So, just a br in a brass tax way, I, I don't think it's sustainable for us to become continue to be dependent on central banking, um, the federal government to such a degree with its largesse and its uh, and its uh, you know control structures um, and. Also, the way corporations are constituted, they, you know, I think as the world becomes more complex, they're finding that they have to adopt new internal self-organization structures like sociocracy, like holacracy, in order to deal with the information problems of sending information up and down chains and command chains of command, as well as um, decision decision making power up and down chains of command. That this command and control hierarchies that still hold very much hold sway. The Taylorite model of the firm is still very strong um, in society, but I don't think that that's sustainable with respect to how complex the world is becoming and how competitive it is becoming. So I do, uh, and, and I'm not even bringing up all of the, all of the great power struggles that are happening right now um, with, with respect to Russia and the realignment of the world powers. Just take that out of the picture. I still think that there's a, a an unsustainable way that 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 these systems are working, and so if we come to a moment where we have we have to confront no longer being dependent on these systems, we are going to have to become interdependent. We're going to have to become more dependent on these uh, the, each other, and that will create incentives for us to remember how to be good again, how to raise a barn. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of barn raising. Um, but in much of the old days and throughout the, 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 the Amish community today, the Amish are, uh, the Mennonites, the, the, um, and then back in the old days where I come from in North Carolina, you would, someone lost their tobacco barn, which in North Carolina, everybody grew tobacco, right? So if someone lost their barn, everybody in the community would turn up to help them rebuild it. And that process was a communitarian effort. And to, to the extent that we can start to re-instantiate models of mutual aid and coordination at scale, across ge both across geographies and sometimes in local geographies, I think we'll come to find that um, 
that we're stronger, more resilient, and more sustainable for it. And that's what I hope to see in 2025. So it sounds like the, the answer is a tipping point. I think there's going to be a tipping point. I would love it for it to be a progression, an evolution, a consciousness awakening, uh, where more and more people sort of, I mean, like, why, why the hell write a book unless you hope that some people are going to read it and be inspired by it, share it with their friends and suddenly adopt a perspective. Uh, I'm under no illusions, though. I think it's going to take the brute force of incentives to get people to change. So uh, I want us to get some time uh, questions from all the other participants here today, but uh, I want to ask you a couple of questions. You've answered a lot, so I don't have very many other questions to ask because you've you've done a really good job of not just uh, answering but explaining what it is that uh, that you think. Is is there in your mind um, a handful of of things that might be barriers that you can see now uh, towards this happening? Things that would prevent this from happening? Yeah, um, the first, uh, the first is our a, a kind of a collective outsourcing our sense. This, this, what I described as I describe it as the church of politics, um, and I don't know if this has happened in in other countries. I don't want to speak for other countries. I only have the data in the United States, but for the first time in 2020, for the first time in in the history of the country, attendance in church, synagogue, mosque, whatever, dipped below. 50%. Okay. So even though we don't have a, you know, a, a, the, the United States doesn't have this, like a church of England or, you know, or something that, that is, that is the, that is the, yeah, th there's a free market in religion in the United States, which, which has made re religion quite robust over the years. But part of that is that churches not only provided some sort of moral mooring, and I'm not saying everything. I'm not saying everything that churches do is great. Much less organized religion. It has a dark history of, in lots of ways. Um, I just mean that for many people, it's a source of community, a source of mutual aid, a source of moral teaching, and all of those things are being lost as the country secularizes. And I'm I'm secular. I'm not I'm not a, a, a any kind of believer. I I love drawing from the world's traditions. Um, and, and really try to do that in, in the decentralist um, is, is, to, is to patch together a, a coherent secular worldview that brings out the best from the religious traditions that people are jettisoning. That, but that loss, I feel like that loss of mission, morality, and meaning um, is one of the greatest impediments. Because the idea now is if, 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 if I have a political team or an ideological affiliation, that that is simply enough. If I telegraph my, my righteous indignation about this topic or that, or I, I say, you know, I'm on this team and I support what's right and good. And that is basically worship, worship, worshiping in the church of politics. Then the idea, then, then that is an impediment to the local embrace of moral practice. Okay. Of putting your actions where your mouth is. Um, so that's a first big one. I think there are also great incentive structures that cause this too. It's like, you know, we're we're our we're taught we're taught every day, at least in this country, that uh, some form of civic religion is, you know, voting in elections and being partisan. And we have, on the one hand, we have a lot of hyper capitalism, which is you know commercial relationships, production, trade, and all that stuff. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that in my view, uh, but it's not enough. Right. So um, there's a whole other universe. If you look at Adam Smith's two twin volumes, he had one, one was the wealth of nations, which is the sort of the first big economic manifesto. But his other book was Theory of Moral Sentiments. And the Theory of Moral Sentiments is the is the is the book that really needs to work in tandem with the wealth of nations. Likewise, when we think about living in uh, commercial capitalist societies, we need to couple that with background morality, background commitment to community. Um, and if we outsource that to politics too much, we start to lose it. And all we're left with is politics and capitalism. And that's a toxic mix. 
So I think those are great impediments to, to our vision for my vision for 2045. I don't know to what extent I share my vision with you guys, but I worry about that. I see it everywhere. I see the toxicity everywhere. I see the, the disunity and disharmony um, it, and it troubles me. And I really do believe that we can reconfigure the social protocols so that people can self-organize into their particular conceptions of the good um, in, in, in ways that uh, ne create new niches of possibility and that these can compete for adherents and participants and members. And when we do that, we can start to have more competitive dynamics. Not everything has to be monolithic or centralized or, you know, where, you know, 180 million people turn up at the polls to fight over which party gets to, you know, control the apparatus of power. That seems like a crazy way to run a society to me. In fact, I don't even think societies can be run or fixed or planned or designed. But local communities, self-organized with conscientious, compassionate, loving people, that's where the action is. That's, first of all, thank you for sharing that because that's uh, a beautiful um, description of what I think most of us, if not all of us, um, understand to be where we need to go. Um, but the, the clarity with which you describe the problems or the risks, uh, I think is also uh, very compelling. So thank you for that. A on the other side of that spectrum, um, and this will be my last question before I open it up to, to folks, what movements do you think are already happening? And you've named some of them already um, that uh, you think are in support of this vision that you have? What else is happening out there that you think they're, whether they know it or not, they're behind you in, in, in this vision? Oh, this is a really good question. And it's, you know, when, when as you ask me, it's one I realize that I haven't reflected on enough um, in, in, in ways, I think, in important ways. And let me, let me explain as follows. Like, I'm, I'm really into... Uh, certain kinds of communities of, of promise to me are what um, what the crypto folks are doing um, ever since 2009, you know, whether or not you like Bitcoin, there's an entire ecosystem, competitive ecosystem of cryptocurrency tokens and technological tools. There are tools and rules. So there's a, it's, a, it's, uh, Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian philosopher, is credited with saying, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. And that is a beautiful, I, I don't think he actually said it, but um, in, in any case, it's, it's such, a, such a, an important little quote, because I think it has a corollary that is, we shape our rules and then our rules shape us. But we also shape our rules. So there's a vacillating tandem between culture and morality on the one hand, and institutions and rules on the other and tools. And the cryptocurrency space, for example, with DAOs represents the possibility of changing the rules, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, decentralized processes that allow the participants to shape their own rules. And if they so shape, and have these uh, certain kinds of moral dispositions, I think they're gonna be more or less likely to succeed in the creation of these new niches, these new communities. Um, so cryptocurrency space is extremely promising for me. Uh, another is the uh, self-management systems or they're called self-management. A lot of people like self-organization, but this includes stuff like holacracy, sociocracy, um, the teal organizations in the, in, in the book, um, um, reinventing organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that, that, that process is currently unfolding, but that community is way too small. Um, I saw something pop up about, uh, Mondragon in, in Spain. There's Ricardo similar, similar down in, uh, down in, uh, uh, Brazil. These, these interesting models, some of them are better than others. In my opinion. Um, I don't, I, I tend not to like, uh, 
uh, democratically run or majoritarian cooperatives. I think there's a lot of weaknesses to those models, but the, but whatever, it doesn't matter what your model is. So people don't like holacracy too, because it takes a long time to onboard. You know, you have to really, really get everyone to reframe internally how they operate uh, from a command and control mindset to a uh, holacracy mindset. So all of these things have transition costs. And we have to be mindful of that. And that's one of the primary reasons I think this community is so small. Another is that I believe more or less in stage theory, um, some, some kind of stage theory, not necessarily spiral dynamics or integral theory, but those, those I think inform us with heuristics that there is some level of um, you know, maturation or coming to think in a certain way. Uh, when you start to see the pathologies of traditional organizations, and there is a cognitive and spiritual even leap that has to take place before you start to, to see that. Um, <clears throat> so the cryptocurrency uh, self-management or self-organization, and then there's just the people, and I really admire these folks, because I am i don't tend to be this way. Um, the, the people who just get out and start and, and try to meet their neighbors to try to form community um you know they everybody used to joke about how barack obama was a community organizer before he came president but like actually admire that people who organize communities people who do things where there's there's not any kind of direct uh return to them for participating in those in those communitarian efforts except for the community itself the, that i think the the extent to which people are moving in that direction and away from uh you know the sort of domination politics that we're seeing or you know aggressive um we gotta we gotta turn people out to the polls so that we can mute or suppress those voices that that kind of um the the people who are sort of walking away from that and walking into building community i i just I admire those people and there are myriad projects out there I could I could point to in that regard. Yeah, and, and I think when we look at that list as you've just done, um, what we realize is that uh, whether they're small or large and their communities just happening or big organized movements, in general, what's emerging is going in the right direction we don't see a whole lot of going the other direction other than the establishment itself. Uh, and so that's the really interesting part. Well, thank you, Max. I'm going to open it up and I know Alicia has a question. So uh, Alicia, if you unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Max. Uh, and thank you, uh, jo Jose, for uh, bringing this conversation. Um, I lived in many countries and uh, one of the things that uh, pops. Up. There are two things pop up. One of the things that community uh, is very important in certain countries, and then people do reach out. Um, and they there's there's a saying in Spanish that your closest sibling is your next door neighbor. Is your closest neighbor. Uh, so um, so that actually happens, and I think uh, the trick is to bring that into mainstream uh, America, which to me it has a contradiction because it's the most capitalist society that I've lived in, but it's also the most generous one. So what you pointed out that Americans would go and extend a hand to somebody they don't know in a way that I find admirable uh, because in other countries you would only help the people that you know. And here you would help people that there's no way they can repay you back. That's called the stewardship theory in, um, in uh, sociology and entrepreneurship is very well researched. Uh, but, but then I think it creates this emptiness that you're not part of a tribe. And, and then I start reflecting upon uh, what I've been reading about indigenous knowledge. There's a great book called Sand Talk um, written by an Aboriginal Australian. I, I happen to be Australian, uh, one of- Tyson Yunkapura, isn't that his name? I'm sorry? Tyson Yunkapura, I think is something name like that, something yes. like that. Tyson, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sand, sand talks uh, on my I, list. Yeah, and it, it's it's really interesting. It's about indigenous knowledge, and then a friend of mine uh, recommended another book about end of life, and I, 
I, I often think who I am when I'm not here, who I'm, who I'm, who, what is my essence when I'm not here in time and space, when I'm no longer alive. And I think that is, that is a question that needs to be asked. But when I, so I want to hear your opinion about that, but what really concerns me is the talk of morality. Because morality in Saudi Arabia is as valid as morality in America, is as valid as morality in Cuba, is as valid as morality in Sweden or in Denmark or in Venezuela or in Australia. So my, my concern is that morality to me seems to put more walls than bridges because we're right and somebody else for us to be right, somebody else has to be wrong. Whereas positive inquiry and, and curiosity, it's it's what I think we need to uh, we need to foster to build bridges. So I wanted to get your opinion about what do you mean by morality and how do you think that might help or hinder our progress together, not at expense to each other of each other. Yeah, this is a, su such, such good points and such a great question. Um, and, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart because this is challenging. Um, this is, challenges me every day, this, these two questions. The first one about, about posterity, about what, the, what you're leaving after you die. This is actually the number one thing that haunts me. This is what, this is the, what motivates me more than anything. And I don't know that other people are this way, but I, I, I want to hear from this group, if you feel the same way, I, I, I often wonder secretly if I'm more motivated by that than anything, because I don't believe in an afterlife. So for me, my afterlife is to leave traces, is to leave patterns of myself in the world that positively benefit others. especially my family. <clears throat> now onto the question of um, what you might call cultural relativism. Um, I, am, I am not a postmodern. Um, I do think that there are some moral universals. So, but I would say that if we, if, uh, I am in, in, in many ways what I'd like to call an upgraded liberal, okay? I can't help that I come from, I, I was studied in, the, in, in England at the University College London for graduate school in moral philosophy, political philosophy. That's about as the center of the Anglo-American world as you can get in terms of my biases. So I want to acknowledge that straight away. I'm also an American. Um, and... Americans stole all of their best ideas from from the British liberals, okay, of the Enlightenment. Um, I don't think really anyone can deny that. Uh, for, in terms of just like the the um, the sort of basic structures. Now, I also think that we're losing that. So when I say upgraded liberalism, it's important for me to qualify that. I see generations moving through the stage of postmodern cultural relativism. Um, and relativism, moral relativism, cultural relativism, and so on. Which when so when you say Saudi Arabia is no better than thus and so, I would say perhaps or yes and. Um, depend and I, I would orient it at orient that around um, no better than X at what, at what end? And the, the remaining question there to, you know, what is, what is that um, at what are they no more, you know, better or worse culturally or morally is I'm sure gonna, you know, we could, we could argue about that endlessly here for me, what I've tried to do in The Decentralist is find what I would consider to be uh, the, the, what I call the six spheres. And I try to do uh, integral theory is of Ken Wilber and some of these other um, 
philosoph philosophies, you know, or inform this. But the idea is that if we need to upgrade uh, from modernism or postmodernism, our idea of morality, because I'm, I, I'm a meta-ethical skeptic in, in that I don't think there's any th such thing as objective reality, that there's a world, that, there, that there's some morality waiting out there like a quark or a star or a something else for us to discover and then apprehend and write it down in the book of knowledge. So in that sense, I agree with the postmoderns and I agree with you. What, where, however, what I do think in, in the sense of there's timeless universals, is if we go from the, uh, the idea of abstract rules that we pluck from the sky in certain in instances, like, oh, I'm in a moral conundrum right now. I'm in a moral quandary. What does my moral theory say about this? That is an that's abstraction land. To, to ancient timeless practices, for example, um, uh, Hillel the Elder, is is a um, is a rabbi who, God, I want to probably three thousand years ago, um, came up with the formulation that which is hateful to you, do not do not uh, do to your neighbor. That which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. What does that sound like? You're, you're sorry, muted, sorry. Alicia. Yeah, that yeah. is extremely dangerous in some countries. I'm a woman. I was in Saudi Arabia. It's not mm -hmm. what we see from here. But what I, what I realize moving countries is that morality, the word morality, uh, excuse my ignorance, um, but the word morality causes more division because what is right for me and what I like and I dislike might hinder progress of us as a society, but might be accepted as, as uh, morally appropriate in a country or in a mm -hmm. society or in a sub-tribe. So in Saudi Arabia, you have the nomadic tribes and you have the sedentary tribes. They have completely different views of the world. Um, and, you know, and both of them are different from mine. But, but you know, my... My, cons my, my question to you is really, it's, it's, it's appreciative inquiry. It's a question uh, more than anything else is, would you, would you redefine morality as a way of, of uh, helping us decentralize and giving people the opportunity to participate without being judged? Because that, that is my impression. But yes, the, 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 world, the word morality has gotten toxic, has become toxic. And I think okay. you're absolutely right about this. I, I am, and, and, and really the decentralist and my decentralism, okay, is not a moralistic doctrine, except for these few basic things. If we are going to self-organize into communities of practice, we need to be able to practice certain basic things that we can't initiate violence against other people. So when I said the, the, the Hillel the Elders, 4, 000, three or 4,000 years old uh, version of the golden rule, I said that is 4,000 years old and, and the golden rule, some variation on it, it can have slight twists and turns, but it, it, it exists in almost every culture, okay? And that predates Christianity, um, the, you know, the, the, Ancient Hebrews practiced it. The Hindus have been practicing ahimsa uh, since the time of, because it's a Sanskrit word. So we know how old that is. It's like, we see these, these, you know, patterns. And I'm saying, let's make good use of them in the context of creating our own communities. Um, you know, I, I also, it's integrity, compassion, stewardship, um, rationality. You know, these, these kind of virtues and values can be universal in the sense that if we actively, continuously, and consciously practice them, um, I talked about this with, with Jose, Jose and, and his group uh, just yesterday, so forgive me for repeating it, but I think this is a good story. Um, 
in uh, the, one of the interpreters of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and this is thousands of years old text that was originally in Sanskrit, describes the yamas, okay, the yamas of the Yoga Sutras. The, the yamas are pretty darn good rules for living, and they're thousands of years old. Why should we jettison, jettison them now? Uh, because we're trying to figure out too much where they fit in the context of some society that, at least from my perspective, can be fairly brutal, particularly to, uh, you know, to, to half the population, uh, and I mean women with respect to Saudi Arabia. Um, now, that aside, those are my liberal biases. I can't deny that. That being said, I, I, I do believe that in the context of forming new rules, new tools, new communities that allows, allow us to self-organize in inter interdependency for mutual benefit, mutual gain, love, compassion, and all of those things are required as practices, and we can't do without them. I can't imagine living in a community where no one was compassionate. I can't imagine living in a community where no one had integrity. They weren't honest with themselves. They weren't honest with me um, because they're giving rise to essentially uh, mendacity um, where, where I would show up and someone would punch me in the face as a matter of course because of some arbitrary characteristic. So I'm trying to I'm trying to find universals in where perhaps none are, but using them as strong heuristics for community forming. And I hope that that I don't sound doctrinaire because it's in the practice of those and, and coming up short as human beings, we're not going to be perfect. It's in the, the practice of those values and virtues that we improve ourselves as human beings and as members of communities. But but it doesn't, it doesn't mean you're wrong and we're gonna judge you and, and, and some of this, like you know, the puritanical strains of Christianity that have, have existed in this country since its founding, since before its founding, since its colonial, since its colonial days and you know, uh, obviously the treat, mistreatment of the natives, um, the indigenous peoples of, of, of our continent. So I totally see what you're saying. And I'm trying to and I'm trying to communicate to to the the cultural relativists. Yes, you're right. And under certain circumstances, you may you may have to play by those rule sets. But if we're gonna architect a more cosmopolitan state of affairs and build local communities in that more cosmopolitan state of affairs, we don't want to jettison these these practices. And that's all. Thank you for that excellent question, Alicia. Yeah, that was that was really great. And, and thank you for the answers, Max. Now, we, we've got a couple of minutes left. And I was hoping that uh, others would have time if they have questions. Uh, but we're kind of running, um, running a bit late, unless you have the ability to hang out for a few more minutes, Max. Um, I know some of us have to depart soon. If, if anyone else has a question, please I already got to exercise thanks to the chat. So um, I've been sort of commenting along the way here. Um, the, yeah, the, thanks for that. Those are some the, really the good last one. We need to find universals because for about a thousand years, Europe's, and you know, it's, it's what you're talking about is difficult because for about a thousand years, uh, we've been killing, the rulers have been killing off the remaining people who live by indigenous community values and um, setting up the age of colonialism. So we have that to get out from under, but it, when we realize that that's what it is we're trying to, get from, uh, get, trying to get out from under, it becomes a lot easier to identify, oh yeah, that's that, I'm over here. And I was a witness to Jim Crow when I was four or five years old. So I was like a witness to a crime all around me. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll betray. Um, I, I don't know if that was a question aimed at me, but I want to just really it was quickly. A, say, it was a share. Well, it was, it was a good one, and I just want to just really quickly, if, if, um, not to deny anyone else's time, I just say that the profound influence on, on me of um, the Satyagraha of Gandhi, 
of nonviolent resistance um, and MLK. Yep, yep, absolutely. And in, in the way you phrase that, Mark, it, um, one of the things I'm realizing in, in um, listening to Max as I have twice this week, that's a lot of Max, but uh, you know, it's good. Um, <laughs> um, is that that we share a lot of the same language and um, rules and tools are two very distinct things. When we know that something is a tool, it doesn't take power over us. It is for us to use for ourselves. But when we have rules and rulers, then the power has been taken away from us. Um, and I think that's the kind of language that I, I really appreciate from what uh, Max is, is using and, and things like interdependence, which are essential. I think human beings and, and our behavior, if it is not based on interdependence, that's when our morality falls apart because that's when we start thinking that we're more than those that that uh, are the others, whatever the other means. I, I just wanted to give Dean an opportunity to ask yeah. a question if he if he uh, would like to, and then maybe we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Jose. Max, it's been an, it's been brilliant just listening to you. The, the words you use, the way you articulate it, I've absolutely loved it. I run a business here that um, in New Zealand, we connect with every farmer in the country every week um, through a print publication, so traditional. But we're moving that into a, um, our whole obsession is to turn this into a community where they can connect in the digital world. So, you know, the Centre for Humane Technology and the new public um, guidelines and things, you know, we're, we're, we're working with this. I've had to take people around me that have, who can help a lot more than I've, you know, than I can with my own skill set to be able to do this. But it's the most exciting project because we've got a disenfranchised farming community here that get smashed by people who know better on social media. So that need for connection and community and support and, and uh, you know, a lot more participatory led um, uh, um, strategy is, is so paramount. I'm just wondering, is there anything that you could guide me to? Because the way, your words are brilliant and that's, and it is about the messaging largely. We've actually engaged World a linguist in Australia, the world public speaking champion he has been. So um, he is helping us through this and his company because of the importance of it and the need for us to be able to get it right first time. So I'm just wondering whether there is just, um, you know, based on that little knowledge I've been able to give you as to as to what we're trying to do, where you might guide me to read, to watch, to to learn, to listen. In, in for it, and just to clarify, is there a particular end that you're trying uh, to achieve with that? Uh, just open channels of communication with the farming community is your primary focus. Okay, so you, it, it is about um, the sharing and fusing of information and data to be able to allow for also for um, if you think of you to me and in masterclass, we've got um, we've set up a, a similar learning type system which is now off the ground. So it is about that whole you know, what it takes for an industry like the primary sector here to be able to connect and to be able to share that knowledge and to be able to be feel as though the um, the people who are actually, you know, on the ground, that they are actually part of the, they're feeling um, part of the, uh, the direction of the industry. Whereas at the moment they're feeling, it's very feeling very top down with a whole lot of embedded institutions that do need to reach the tipping point you talk about here as soon as possible. <laughs> I mean, there's so many, there's so many, um, I guess you could say change vectors, um, but you, you did focus on, on communication. Um, so one, one of them, one of them, I think it, that could be instructive in, gosh, it is um, off the top of my head, Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. Let me give you my email. Let me get everyone my email address in case. I would love to, to hear from you and be in contact with you. Um, <clears throat> and um, 
that might work as well. But um, Jonathan Haidt's uh, work, the, the Righteous Mind, is he's a he's an academic, he's a moral psychologist. But one of the things that he discusses in terms of uh, commu communication is the idea that we have different moral taste buds. Okay, and this is his metaphor. He calls them moral matrices, um, where you have one matrix of morality might be care versus harm, or sanctity and purity versus you know. Um, the opposite of that. This, these dimensions of of um, of our, I guess, moral makeup. He studies them in different groups of people, and um, and believes that we have certain dispositions, uh, embedded dispositions, as different people, one to the next. We could be even born with in some genetic sense or some inherent sense, different moral dispositions. And this would make a lot of sense from the standpoint of broad evolutionary theory, right? Sort of Darwinian, uh, the way groups flourish or not, particularly as we start to get above uh, uh, Dunbar's number 150, you start to get more complex societies, you're going to need differences to manifest this, themselves and begin to um, and th those differences are going to start to manifest themselves in a, at a macro scale. But certainly in sub Dunbar situations, we are constantly um, expressing our values. So one of the things that, that I think seeing it in that, it's a rather dispassionate and, and, and sort of, you know, one click or one order of magnitude above the moral conversation would be this sort of moral philosophy or moral psychology. Jonathan Haidt's book is really good in that regard. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, integral theory, um, but particularly, you know, Ken Wilber's uh, theory of everything is a little short book, and he redescribes spiral dynamics. There's a book called Spiral Dynamics that's a lot thicker and and it's more intense, but it it maybe doesn't have all of the. It maybe has too much. It would be drinking of the fire from the fire hose if you're wanting just good handy heuristics for communication tools for different populations. I think the theory of everything book might, might be helpful. And learning to speak in the language, learning to, to communicate your values in the language of other people's values is a very effective communi communication strategy. So if, if I'm gonna talk to someone on the left in the United States, I might speak in terms of oppression, <laughs> right? Uh, or, um, you know, inclusion. If I'm talking to someone on the right in the United States, I might speak in terms of civilization and order, you know, um, and that's, that's a very loose kind of way of thinking, but you can really get drilled down in the, the, the spiral dynamics and in Jonathan Haidt's work. Um, I'll leave it at that. There's a lot more where that came from, but I think those are two great starting points. Uh, for learning to, to, I guess you could say, the way I like to describe it is learning to speak in other people's moral languages. The, the extent to which we can speak other, in other people's moral languages is the extent to which we can be more empathic ourselves, because we're having to activate those neurons and those values in our minds in order to be able to appreciate what they're, where they're coming from. And it uh, makes your communications more effective. I hope that's what you were looking for in that question. And if not, please follow up. And I've got tons of stuff like that. I'm endlessly fascinated with communicating values. Hey, thank you. And thank you, Jose, for being a little bit self-serving there. You've given me, it's going to be an awesome weekend, Doctor, on the farm. I've got a lot to think about out of us. <laughs> well, thank you for showing up, Dean. And uh, thank you really also, Max, um, for sharing with us what I think is a beautiful vision of uh, humanity connecting, uh, reconnecting again and finding ways to uh, to build a society uh, rebuild a society post collapse as one of your books says and finding uh, a way to uh, to make it happen so max thank you for and jumping in last minute because we had a cancellation and max jumped in uh, from yesterday to today so that was really awesome so it was an absolute pleasure and if um 
if I can come and be a fly on the wall or, or a participant in some future thing, this group is amazing. And I, I, I would really love that. Actually, Max, now that you've gone through this process, invite others and interview them in this same type of a model. So um, absolutely, you're, you're, you're hooked now. We've got you on the list. You're <laughs> never going to get away. Uh, but, uh, but certainly would, and, or if you recommend that we invite someone else to interview um, for this Friday Talks. It would be a, our pleasure to do that. Thank you so much for inviting me. I was, it was an absolute pleasure. Mm -hmm.